Good afternoon, and thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, also, uh, thanks to the Special Olympics Massachusetts for uh, helping us put this together. Um, today we're going to speak about planning options for you and your family in relation to special needs trusts. My name is Mark Coletta. I'm the Community Relationship Manager here at Plan of Mass in Rhode Island. I'm joined by Kathy Vitello, our Director of Operations. Uh, Kathy's a uh, licensed social worker and also my personal encyclopedia for all things special needs trusts. Uh, so I'm very happy to have her here with me today to fill in the blanks for uh, anything that we can uh, pass along for information. So today, what are we going to do? Uh, learning objectives. We're going to gain a deeper understanding of what a special needs trust is, uh, understand why a special needs trust is beneficial to you and your family, and learn the responsibilities of a professional trustee, which Plan of Mass Rhode Island is. So if you have any questions, we'd appreciate it if you just put them into the chat box and we'll try to address everything at the end. So Plan of Massachusetts in Rhode Island is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Um, we serve as a professional trustee for special needs trust um, for all individuals of all ages in both the state of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We were originally founded by a group of parents actually in the early 1960s. These parents got together and they were very concerned about who was going to take care of their children when they were gone the same conversations that we're still having today with families. Um, we became incorporated in October of 1971. So we just passed our 50 year anniversary. And to our knowledge, we are the oldest and largest special needs trust in New England. So our mission, um, we proudly serve people with disabilities, lifelong or related to illness, injury or age, helping to preserve assets, protect benefits, and to live well. So we're gonna to touch on uh, how we live our mission throughout this uh, presentation. So a special needs trust is, it's a vehicle or an opportunity for families to be able to set aside funds for a family member with a disability and still have that family member maintain all their public benefits. And we will, as we go through this, talk about different options for that. So, you know, we often get asked, like, is this legal? And yes, it is. Under federal regulations in 1993, known as the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, it's also referred to as OBRA, uh, President Clinton um, signed this act that would allow for funds to be placed into what they call a special needs trust or um, also known as a supplemental needs trust. And these trusts were a way for family members to be able to put aside funds that would help supplement public benefits for individuals with disabilities. Because as we all know, in order to be eligible for those public benefits, the guidelines, you have to meet the poverty guidelines in this country. And um, in the state of Massachusetts, you can have more than $2,000 in assets. And in Rhode Island, it's $4,000 in assets. So um, by now, there's many, many wonderful aspects to your benefits, but there's also a lot of things that aren't covered. So, so what does a special needs trust do? It uh, protects an individual's benefits, um, or it preserves their eligibility to get on benefits. Um, it helps families to create a plan for the future and have some peace of mind that they know that their family member is going to be cared for um, and provides the beneficiary with resources to help improve the quality of life. So, you know, we've worked with many beneficiaries over the years, but in one particular case, we had a beneficiary who ended up choosing plan as the trustee because the family wanted to take the responsibility of that job off the siblings. They wanted to maintain that positive, healthy relationship between the siblings. And they wanted the siblings to be able to go on and live their own lives, you know, um, get married, pursue their careers without having to be tied down to these responsibilities. There's so many rules and regulations with benefits 
and people can impact benefits not knowing that they're making uh, an impact on the benefits. What happens if someone makes a mistake? They could lose a certain percentage of the benefit, and we don't want that to happen. So, um, and one of the very unique features of the services at plan is that we are staffed with a team of social workers. Um, we call them service coordinators, but they are the primary contact between the beneficiary family support systems um, throughout the life of the trust. And they help guide people on accessing their benefits and how to utilize these trust, these funds without impacting those benefits. So why do you need a special needs trust? Um, so there's a number of reasons, but it's proper planning for the future, and it creates peace of mind for you that your loved one is going to be taken care of. Uh, it enables the beneficiary to preserve their benefits and supplement their needs. So um, you know they're, they're not going to put themselves at risk of losing those benefits, uh, and they're going to receive guidance to, uh, as to what the money can be used for in a way that doesn't put those in jeopardy. Uh, and that helps improve quality of life. It improves family relationships. As a professional trustee, we you know handle that aspect that a family member might be asked to do, and it's it's a full time job. I mean, we are a, a, we have an office full of people here. That's all that they do. Um, and this is a lot to ask a, a brother, sister, aunt, uncle to to handle for someone. So uh, it, it improves that relationship, and it assures the future needs will be met. That, uh, that, that you can rest at ease that they're, they're, they're gonna be taken care of. So uh, there's a number of reasons of why a special need trust may work for you. So when we, we look at some statistics, um, the Journal of Disability Policy, they did a study and it reported that a, um, an adult with a disability requires approximately 29% more annual income than you and I would to live the same lifestyle. Um, so having that special needs trust helps supplement that for people while they maintain their benefits. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, there's many wonderful aspects to benefits, but you do have to meet those poverty guidelines. Um, and a special needs trust is not counted as a resource. So once that funds are in the trust, it's not their resource. And it's not considered, there's no um, transfer penalty or look back period with it. So public benefits do have their values, um, and it, you know, it, it can really depend on what the person's needs are as to how valuable they are. But there is a great deal of value in public benefits, and there's many programs that you really need to be on those benefits that, so you can access those programs. Um, so your benefits can be worth tens to thousands of of, of dollars. Um, and many people are on what they call supplemental social security income, which is considered SSI. And if you are on that benefit, you automatically get into your Medicaid program. Um, so, um, you know, in order to get into the DDS, you can apply to DDS for free. Um, and you can begin that application um, at age 17 and a half. A disabled child whose parents are either disabled or a low income or have a small amount of resources can potentially also apply for that supplemental SSI benefit. Um, and usually that benefit is up to age 18. It could be 19, but you would need a letter from school to show that you're still a full-time student. Um, over 18, if you were disabled, you can still qualify for SSI. Um, and then there is Social Security Disability Income, which is different. Um, for a disabled child, though, when a parent retires, then the child can switch from the SSI, Supplemental Social Security Income, to the SSDI, which is Social Security Disability Income. They would get 50% of the parent's retirement. Um, uh, uh, the amount, it doesn't take it away from the parent. It's just equivalent to 50%. Once a parent passes away, the child is eligible for 75% of that benefit. 
it doesn't mean that they'll lose their Medicaid. They could still be eligible for Medicaid because that's a means tested benefit that's only looking at your resources. And then one of the positives about being on the, the disability SSDI, excuse me, is that after 24 months you become eligible for Medicare as well. And when people are on SSDI, the Social Security Disability Insurance, they could actually work and make up to you know $1,350 a month and still maintain those benefits. Um, so. Um, a lot to keep track of. Yeah, it is. It, it gets very difficult to na navigate. It can be very confusing. And we have seen people, you know, innocently impact people's benefits. You know, a, a mom that goes to Social Security for a redetermination, the child lives, the adult child lives at home, and Social Security says, oh, they live at home. Do they pay rent? Do they buy their own groceries? And of course, you're a mom or a dad, and you're going to say, oh, no, I take care of that, and boom, they've just lost 30% of their um, SSI income. Lots to keep track of, and yep. it's good to have a professional you can call on to determine that. Yeah, so we um, there are different types of special needs trusts, and we, we'll explain these, but we're really going to focus this conversation on what we call the third-party trust. So when we talk about a special needs trust, we also can refer to them as a D4A, which is a first party trust. And it is a one trust document and one beneficiary, right? And then there's a third party standalone, which again is one trust document and one beneficiary. And then there's what is referred to as a D4C, which is a pool trust, which has both a first party and third party trust can be put into the pool. First party trust means that the funds belong to the individual. That means I got a settlement or I got an inheritance that the funds went directly into my hands. Those are my funds. And I open a trust. It has to be what they call a first party trust, whether it's a D4A or in the pool. And those funds have a lien against them. Medicaid is entitled to be paid back for anything that they paid out during your lifetime. A third party trust, whether it's a standalone or in the pool, means that I decide to put funds aside for you into a special needs trust. Those funds are for your benefit, but they never belong to you. So Medicaid has no right to those funds. And at the end of your life, those funds would go wherever I decided that they would go. So the donor of those funds gets to choose where the remaining funds go. And the other option is what we call a future funded trust. This means that you're doing all your planning. Um, you know, you've worked with your estate attorney or, and you've done your will or you have your um, like life insurance or IRAs or whatever. And um, you, so what you do is you set up this vehicle, which is the future funded third party trust. And then you make the designation, the third party trust for the benefit of who the individual is. So the trust will become funded through your estate. So it's never too early to get started. Never. In a third party trust, anybody can put funds into a third party trust. First party trust, it's those are my funds. Only I can put funds in there. So examples of ways to fund a trust. So the third party, which she, uh, Kathy just discussed, uh, can be through life insurance, can be inheritances from uh, family members. Uh, the, the first party, on the other hand, is, is your own money. So that is settlements, um, existing funds that you have under your name. Um, so, you know, one way to do that is set up a future, a, a way to um, support your child is to set up a future funded trust. That way, you know, you could you could plan for that future uh, potential event of an inheritance or a life insurance payout. Yeah, so, you know, through the years, we've spoken to so many families that are, their, their anxiety is so high, they feel like they can never retire. They just worry so much about what's going to happen when they're gone that they don't know what to do. And this is a good way to provide that peace of mind for family members is that if they have this set up, 
they use their 401s or their life insurance, they can retire and still know that there's funds available for the trust when the time comes. Um, so you would just, you know, take out your life insurance and just use that beneficiary designation as the third party special needs trust for your family member. Um, and this way, and this is very important, is just that you don't want these funds to end up being first party. I mean, it's not the end of the world, it's just that Medicaid has a lien against them. Once funds go to the disabled individual, they have 30 days to do something. Otherwise, they lose all their benefits. So you don't want that to happen. Um, I recently spoke to somebody who called this the uh-oh trust <laughs> because, you know, somebody in the kindness of their heart left the disabled person money without realizing the negative impact. Now, once benefits are gone, is it like to so get back. anybody who's applied for benefits knows what an overwhelming task it is to apply for a benefit, but to be on benefits, lose them and have to reapply, it's twice the nightmare because you have to account for every penny wow. that disqualifies you. So, and the other important thing I think is in doing it this way is that you know that your wishes will be carried out. We've seen families who have, you know, done their estate planning and they named Joe as the executive of the state and, you know, he's going to take care of Susie and they tell you in the, in the will, you should put the funds in this trust, but Joe decides, oh, I think I can do a better job with this money. And the funds don't get put up for Susie. And this is a way to ensure that that happens. So now that you know more about special needs trusts, uh, Trustee is the, the next question that you're going to ask. Who is going to administer this for um, your loved one or yourself? Um, so trustee considerations, what do you need to think about when you're making that decision? Uh, what services are needed now and what are you going to need in the future? That's more, almost more important. Um, trying to you know, account for any scenario that can happen. Uh, what technical skills and knowledge are needed as a trustee? Uh, you just heard a lot of it. Uh, understanding benefits and what can affect them. Uh, that's a huge piece. And, and if you're not well versed in that area, you can put benefits at risk. Right. So, you know, we um, recently had a, a case where mom and dad, they did their estate plan. They did a nice job and they named a family member as trustee. And by the time they passed away, this family member herself was elderly and just felt so overwhelmed and felt like she could not take on this responsibility. And it's not just about the disbursement, it's all the other requirements that, you know, the doing the uh, information for the grantor letter, which is for the taxes, and then the reporting letters to the government agencies and the accountings and all of that stuff. And she just thought, I, I can't do this. So what she did was she shopped around and she actually found plans and um, pick plan primarily because of the service coordinator piece. It made her feel really comfortable that there would be somebody out there doing some oversight for him. And then in another instance, we had somebody who came to us, they had picked a sibling and the sibling got a job that was far, far away and you know, really couldn't take on that responsibility. Um, so they, again, shopped around to find a new trustee. Sure. I mean, I think at the time you think that a family member is the best person to do it. And then, you know, when it, it's functionally happening, you realize that having a professional that does it full time might be a better way to go. And think about it in anybody's relationship. Sure. Money is not a good mix. No, family and money is difficult. So, yes. so this eliminates that. Yeah, it eliminates that. And it helps preserve that relationship. So now that your loved one will still have the siblings to go to or somebody to turn to and we can be the so-called bad guys if a disbursement is going to impact benefits. Yeah, I mean, being a trustee can be a full-time job and uh, does the individual mind have the time to do it? And mm -hmm. they may at the moment that you think about it, but, right. you know, like the example where somebody has to move across the country for a job or an opportunity comes up to do something else, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's something to consider. And then the trustee can be a nonprofit organization such as PLAN. Um, and, you know, 
again, the resources and the knowledge and the years and years of experience that this office has to manage these is uh, a difference maker. So I think that one of the things we forgot to mention is, is that um, people from 65 and over, the only option they have is to do the pool trust. In the federal regu regu regulations, blah, blah, the federal regulations state that you have to be a nonprofit organization in order to serve as a professional trustee. So that's anyone over 65? Yes, they have to use the pool. Okay. So I think that we just touched on these, you know, the responsibilities about the. Um, investments, the accounting, the taxes, the reporting, all of that stuff is handled by a professional trustee. But even if it's a family member, they're still required to fulfill all those obligations. Um, and we, we're able to sit in and, and, you know, provide the guidance over the benefits and what's going to impact them. But also um, we work with, here at Plan, we work with Webster Bank. So we, um, get together and talk about the investment strategies as well. Yeah, the investment strategy is, you know, it, 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 they use, it, it's conservative and it's it's not going to put the money at risk. I mean, we're not, we're not investing in Bitcoin or anything volatile. It's going to, your money's going to be there at the, the end of the day. Um, it, it, it's, it, but it's good to have that professional fiduciary knowledge right. that will, you know, have the best interest of the person to being it is investing the funds. Right. So we're looking at your age, we're looking at your disability, we're looking at your needs and some maybe some anticipated needs yep. and what your living costs are that your benefits don't cover. All of those things are taken into consideration as we look at investment categories. So at plan, we have no minimum to establish a trust, which is also, uh, I think, personally, a unique feature. I think that if you went to a bank or any other professional type of corporate trustee, so to speak, their minimums are usually 500000 or a million dollars or more before they'll even open the trust. A lot of banks won't even do these types of trust just because of the the knowledge that you need to administer them and the the risk that you, they would take on in you know potentially losing somebody's benefits i mean that's that's something a bank isn't generally equipped to deal with there, there's some uh, but again the ones that do it mm -hmm. require half a million million dollars in deposits in order to to get that done right and you know we have the social workers on staff again, which is unique. And I keep saying that because I'm a social worker, right? So you're going to pat me on the back. No, I'm kidding. So um, we take a very holistic approach, I think, here. Yeah. Uh, and it's an all inclusive model, right? So I think when you use that corporate trustee or the bank, you know, there's a lot of hidden fees. You're going to get charged for phone calls, you're going to get charged for emails. You're going to get charged for all the checks that are written and all of that. And this is all inclusive. Um, we review all of the disbursement requests. We issue the checks here. We have the um, professional investment and we do the annual accounting. We prepare, or will you, or Young actually does it, but there's a statement prepared on the trust. It's either called a grantor letter, which is used for the first party trust, and a K1 that is used for a third party trust and people take that document when they're having their personal income taxes done. So professional trustee services is what we offer and uh, what comes with that. We discussed a lot of it, but you know, annual statements, weekly disbursements being processed, the tax information that's so important that you get right, um, filing the annual 1041, uh, social workers who are experienced in public benefits and you know professionally management and managed investments of funds i mean that's all all encompassing handles every aspect of this trust that you could potentially need right and and so the management fee covers that trust administration and investment and the social work component so we have a um very experienced team of social workers here probably well over 100 years worth of experience when you put us all together. Um, and they're well versed in public benefits and have lots of experience working with people that have disabilities. Um, so they provide that guidance 
and support on how to use these trust funds without impacting your benefits. Um, and they work directly with beneficiaries, families, power of attorney, whoever the support is for the beneficiary. Um, and how do we do that? We know our beneficiaries. We do this face-to-face. -face. When somebody joins this trust, we meet with them and whoever they want, they have their support systems. It could be a family member, a power of attorney, whoever, but we meet with them. We wanna see where they're living. We wanna make sure that they're being cared for. And we wanna make sure that they're accessing all of the benefits that they're entitled to. And then we wanna make sure that, um, you know, they're getting all of the services that they need. So we're looking at some immediate needs and, you know, some of the things that they can't afford on just their benefits. And then we're looking at what could happen down the road. Like what should we take into consideration and make sure that we have some funds set aside for the future. And then we talk about your wish list. Like what are some of the things that you would really like to do that you haven't been able to do? Um, and you know, for a lot of people, it could be something as simple, simple as just taking music lessons or sure. art lessons. We can become very creative in how to use these funds to, we really hope that we can say at the end of the day that we improve this person's quality of life. That's really important to us, yeah. you know, um, and it's important that our service coordinators know our beneficiaries so that they can build that relationship. Um, you know, we've done things like pet visits, Reiki, alternative therapies, um, all kinds of creative things. You know, you can't see in here, but there's some pictures hanging up of um, some art that beneficiaries have done for us. Um, and then for those future funded people, while the account is unfunded, you still work with your service coordinator. And what we do with a donor, whether it's a parent, grandparent, or whoever's established this account, we fill out what we call a life care plan. And in this life care plan, we're gonna ask you all about the family, all about the beneficiary and the beneficiary's needs, providers, benefits, all of those things, other relationships and beneficiary's interests. And at the very end of it, we're gonna ask you, what are your goals for this? these funds, right? You know, we can't 100% promise, but we do our best to follow those wishes. Um, so it's really important that we keep up this relationship. And you don't just meet at the beginning, right? Nope. We stay in touch until the account is funded, and then we start working with the beneficiary more closely. Excellent. So um, let's say you've decided to move forward with plan. How do you get started? Uh, best resource that we have is our website, uh, plan of mass, uh, plan of ma-ri.org. Uh, it's up on the screen there. Uh, please visit it. A lot of helpful information on there. Uh, if you did want to start an application, you could also do that online. Uh, so everything is at our website. Um, the second step, choose an attorney. And if you don't have one or don't know of one, give us a call. We'll, we'll, we'll provide you some suggestions. Uh, some, some attorneys that we've worked with that we know will do a good job. Uh, third step would be to deposit funds into the trust. And then the fourth step is to meet with the service coordinator to, to determine needs, set up the plan, and, and um, really understand what we can do to help you know, the quality of life, preserve the benefits, and ensure that the, the trust works for the entire family. So, you know, we don't require that you have an attorney. No. But, you know, you're signing legal documents, so it's always good to have an attorney um, lay eyes on that before you sign away. Sure, yeah. um, and, you know, it's really important that you use an attorney that specializes in this area. Whether you use us or not as a trustee, you really should have an attorney that specializes in this area. There, If you drive around, you'll see billboards, I do estates, I do trust, blah, blah. But there are really attorneys out there that are certified in elder law and special needs. You know, and I tell people all the time, if you go out and break a bone, you're not going to your eye doctor to get it fixed, yeah. right? So it's really very similar. There are attorneys who specialize in certain areas. And as we said earlier, the reason that we really focused most of this on third-party trust was because 
it is really the better way to go. There's no Medicaid payback to it. There's no interruption of the benefits. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world if we have to do first party. It, it really isn't, but third party is better at the end of the day. Oh, this is everybody's favorite subject, ABLE, Achieving a Better Life Experience. So, believe it or not, this is a great partnership, a special needs trust in your ABLE account, because what one can do, the other can't. So, with ABLE, um, it was passed in 2014 by the IRS, um, and it is that you're allowed to put in whatever the gift tax rate is for the year. So currently that is 16,000, correct? I believe right. so, yes. So you can't put more than 16,000 a year into an ABLE account. You can only have one ABLE account. And ABLE has a little tiny print of a, what we call a clawback. And that means from the date your ABLE account is established, Medicaid is entitled to come back at the end of somebody's life and grab what they're owed for whatever they paid out during that time period. Where with your third party trust, you don't have that, right? And your third party, with your trust, you can put any amount you want in there. You could put a billion dollars in if you want it, but you restrict it with ABLE. The amount in your trust is never, never impacts your benefits. So it could go up to a million dollars, but if with your ABLE account, once you hit 100,000, your benefits are suspended. You don't lose them, but they're suspended. Once you get up to 500,000, you lose your benefits. And with your ABLE account, you're technically restricted to what they consider qualified disability expenses. So that could be rent and food, you know, and medical treatment. So, with your SSI, your Supplemental Social Security Income, we talked about the potential for re reduction. So Social, Social Security looks at what they call in-kind support and maintenance. And that means that anybody gets any assistance with rent, food, or utilities, you will lose a percentage of your SSI benefit. That's considered in-kind support and maintenance. So your trust is not going to want to make those disbursements if they don't have to. Yeah but your ABLE account can make that. And one of the nice things is, is that your trust can fund your ABLE account. So the exception to that $16,000 a year is if your individual is working, they can actually deposit an additional $12,880 from working income into their ABLE account. Um, this, again, this dollar amount is dictated by the federal poverty guidelines, so it is subject to change. Your pool trust does not have those restrictions of qualified disability expenses. We can send you on a vacation. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, we can do, you know, all kinds of things that your ABLE account can. But it is a really great partnership. You know, with your trust, we don't give you cash, but we pay for the goods and, and services on your behalf. But with your, you can't really take cash out of ABLE, but it gives you a little bit of autonomy. Yeah. Um, I think what they do in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, I think both use Fidelity. Yeah. Um, these are set up just like the 529 college accounts, mm -hmm. and I think they give them debit cards. Yes, that's correct. Thank you all for your time. We're going to um, look at the questions that we have and uh, read those and answer them for you. Our contact information is right there if anybody has any questions at all after um, the, the presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of resources here to help you with really anything that you can think of. So uh, send the questions our way, we'd be happy to help. Mm -hmm. For now, let's see, what's the first one? Are there tax issues putting in or removing money to a trust? Um, it depends on the source. It depends on a lot of things. My my advice as a non-CPA would be to talk to an accounting professional yeah. before you fund it, mm -hmm. just to determine if there is, um, you know, because there, there's potential it could. So ensure that, you know, you, you get the best advice, I would say, go to your CPA or accountant. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I already have a special needs trust in my estate plan. Do you provide trustee case management service after the parent's death? So that would be the future funded account, or we could be named in your estate plan as a successor trustee. That's also an option. So if I understand the question correctly, the answer would be yes. Yes. Um, let's see. So inform information on trusts for child support to be deposited so dependent can still receive SSI. Yes, it has to be set up through the court. Um, when you do your child support arrangements, but yes, it can be set up so that those payments come directly into the trust. I would have to double check, but I think that's first slide. If anyone does have questions, please uh, put it in the chat box. And if not, please feel free to reach out. We know this is a huge decision for sure. people and it's really scary. Um, so we don't mind. You can call, email, whatever works for you, whatever your comfort level is. We do not charge to consult with people at all. So please feel free to reach out um, if you want to talk separately about your own individual situation. We're more than happy to chat. So we thank you for your time. We're glad you were able to join us this yeah. afternoon, uh, and we hope that you get to enjoy oh, the hold on. this. We weather. might have one. Oh, okay. We've got one okay. Uh, when I set up a third-party trust, once the money is put in, can it be taken out or not? All special needs trusts, part of the requirement is that they're irrevocable trusts. So the answer is no. Uh, and then when do you fund the trust for your child? So it really depends on your own individual circumstances. A lot of people have found that when they do these future funded trusts that they sometimes will open it with a very small amount of money just so that there's a comfort, comfort level for the beneficiary. They get to know us a little bit and understand the process, but it really depends on your own individual situation. All righty. All right. Well, I hope you all get to enjoy the rest of this lovely day. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And uh, thank you to the Special Olympics. And we had a great time talking at you guys. <laughs> Take care. Have a great rest of your day.